Now, for the most part, the management of COPD and asthma exacerbation is quite similar, except, of course, in the case of asthma, you know, any normalization of the PCO2 and the pH should ring alarms, you know, basically saying that something is about to go really, really bad for the asthma patient. Hi guys and welcome to Quick Guides for Medicine. My name is Vitae, I'm a hospitalist and assistant professor of medicine working in South Carolina. On this channel we discuss medicine and topics around medical education, so feel free to hit the subscribe button. I'll appreciate that very much. You can also like and share the videos if you find any value in it. So COPD and asthma exacerbation, you know, although the majority of these cases can be managed as outpatient, uh, what happens in more serious cases is that you most likely will have to admit the patient if you, you're concerned about a risk of respiratory failure or, or any signs that says, you know, there is an impending, you know, respiratory failure or uh, impending risk of respiratory failure. The first place you always want to begin with uh, COPD and asthma, like with all, you know, cases would be, what are the signs that you see that will indicate that this patient is perhaps uh, um, in COPD or asthma exacerbation? Obviously, dyspnea, shortness of breath, um, cough. It could be productive or non-productive. You're also talking about wheezing, you know, uh, and fever. If there is an underlying uh, infectious trigger uh, to the COPD exacerbation and asthma, because again, it underlies that that thing in acute acute exacerbations of any chronic condition. It's always something that's triggering that exacerbation. And these are typically the signs that you'd find um, uh, uh, in, in patients with COPD and asthma exacerbation. And obviously you have to be mindful of, you know, any signs of respiratory failure. Uh, uh, and like we said in the, the, uh, the video for respiratory failure, you can, you can see the link in the, in the description below that while you're managing the underlying causes of respiratory failure, you're also having to address the respiratory failure. In this case, we're addressing the underlying, the underlying cause of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, any, any respiratory failure. In the case of asthma, it is very important, you know, that for those uh, patients that are not responding to treatment, you should definitely get an arterial blood gas because what you're trying to avoid is a situation where you are having a normalization of the CO2 or the pH, because the expectation in asthma patients is that because they're typically hyperventilating, you know, you have a situation where they're blowing out the CO2, and if you have anywhere near normal PCO2 or near normal pH, which ideally should be, you know, a picture of respiratory alkalosis, if you're having anywhere near normal of those parameters, it's telling you that this patient might be, you know, uh, uh, tiring out and they have an inability to protect their airway if they eventually get tired out and you might have to do something drastic immediately it doesn't always mean that you intubate these patients it just means that you have a very very close uh, attention on them and do all of the things you can do to avert that intubation and obviously if nothing is changing and nothing nothing's working you have to go ahead and you know intubate them so while you're managing the respiratory failure uh, alongside managing the the exacerbation whether it's asthma or or, 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 or COPD, there are certain checklists that you have to have in your mind in terms of what you do to intervene, what you do to help the patient. And one of the first places you want to start, obviously, is bronchodilators. The two common examples that we would use is ipratropium, which is a short-acting anti-muscarinic agent, albuterol, which is a short-acting beta uh, adrenergic agonist. Um, most of the time we have it in a combination. Sometimes you can have it separate, but again, for logistic reasons, it's just easier to give both of them in a combination. So that's always the first place to start, the bronchodilators, you know, get the bronchodilation going on so the patient can breathe a little bit better and address the acute thing going on. The next thing you should consider, obviously, is the systemic glucocorticoids. Um, in the hospital setting, we're very free with using IV, even though there's no clear data suggesting that one has, you know, IV is better than PO, for example, you, you typically, you know, you, you can use either of those, you know, as long as you're doing the appropriate dosing. But for the benefit of being in the hospital, you might as well use IV. They have the IV line. Again, for logistic reasons, it might be easier. It's also important to consider that, you know, for certain patients who have uh, issues with absorption, you know, the PO may not be as effective. That, that, that's a slight consideration to make. Uh, even though, again, efficacy-wise, it's not clear that one is better than the other. It's just easier. 
I think, doing the Ivy uh, um, um, route. And I, I think for most part, that's what most people will do in the emergency room setting, even in an inpatient setting, or even in an ICU setting. Um, the third thing you have to obviously consider would be ruling out other infectious triggers. Because again, like we said, for chronic issues that are coming now, um, to the hospital in the form of an exacerbation, you always ask yourself, is there something that tripped them over? Is there something that pushed them from their baseline, you know, respiratory status or baseline symptom symptomatology to now requiring hospitalization? So rule out infectious triggers, but it's not only to rule out infectious triggers. Now you're getting your chest x-ray and making sure there's no pneumonia there. But in addition to that, if there is a pneumonia, you, you want to provide adequate um, antibiotic coverage um, for these patients. You know, for the most part, if there is no pneumonia, if there is no signs on imaging that there is pneumonia, there are some patients that by default you should, I think according to gold criteria, you should you should still provide antibiotics. And these are patients requiring advanced respiratory support, for example, or patients with very, you know, copious amount of secretions because these are signs that may indicate that these patients actually have some um, pneumonia that might have triggered the acute exacerbation of COPD or asthma. Uh, asthma. Um, uh, the other thing you could possibly consider doing would be a single dose of IV magnesium if nothing is working. Um, again, it's one of those things that it's not entirely clear. There's some studies that suggest uh, the benefits of, of, of them. Uh, single dose magnesium, that is, uh, again, it's one of those things you can throw in there if, if you're worried that the patient is not doing well at all. So after having gone through all of these important points, we just recap very quickly. You're called for a patient with COPD exacerbation or asthma exacerbation. With asthma, you're a bit more curious. You'll be more attentive in, 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 in sense of uh, uh, what's happening with the arterial blood gas. Normalization of PCO2, normalization of PSU suggests, you know, should give you a reason for for panic, you know, not physical panic, but mental panic, that you should do something, you know, drastic and keep a very close eye on the patient. But outside of that, what do you do to address the acute exacerbation? Bronchodilators, systemic glucocorticoids, IV or PO, IV is routinely what is used, uh, rule out infectious triggers, give antibiotics accordingly, you know, atypical coverage will be ideal. Uh, if you wanted to ex extend it, if you in fact find a pneumonia, you would just treat it according to, you know, what you do for pneumonia, depending on the different types of it, whether it's community acquired pneumonia, healthcare associated pneumonia. And then finally, if, you, if none of these things are working, single dose magnesium could help. Again, it's not entirely sure that it would, it's clear that it would, but it could help. It's not going to hurt at least, you know, trying that. So having said all of this, we'll go and practice a, um, an actual case scenario and see if we can apply all of this information into the case. All right, so we'll... we'll uh practice a case scenario and, and look at what we might be able to apply from the things that we've discussed so far. All right, so we have a 33-year-old male who presented to the ER with shortness of breath and wheezing. Initial vitals were unremarkable except for a respiratory rate of 28 and oxygen saturation of 89%. Chest x-ray was negative for any acute intrathoracic process. That's basically saying that there's no pneumonia, pneumothorax, atelectasis, and all that. Um, patient received IV methylprednisolone, methylprednisone and inhaled albuterol um, in the ER and was referred for admission. All right. <clears throat> so what are some of the orders you would put in for the patient for the further management of this patient? And we're assuming now you, the hospital is now being called for admission. How would you go about this? Um, again, I, I want you to try to remember the things that we discussed in terms of the checklist, the things that you should do to help the patient out before we go ahead and show the answer here. So <clears throat> obviously you see here that there is some elements of uh, respiratory failure. Typically respiratory rate of more than 25, ideally would be considered, you know, respiratory distress and a combination of that with, <clears throat> with uh, uh, low oxygen saturation clearly is respiratory failure. So there is respiratory failure. So again, like we said, the first thing you're doing is addressing that respiratory failure. Oxygen supplementation, obtaining arterial blood gas. In the case of an asthma patient, you're, you're being mindful of the uh, PCO2, all right? And the pH as well, right? Um, we're also saying here that you will then have to start IV glucocorticoids you could do po you know but again logistically it's just easy to do the iv and i think 
Uh, and again, it's just it, it just it just ensures that the patient is getting the best of what they could possibly get in the in the hospital setting. Um, uh, we also will continue clearly the bronchodilators. It's good to have a PRN dose as needed and also have a schedule because you don't want a situation where you put the bronchodilators and nobody gives it to the patient because the patient didn't ask for it, you know, and you know the patient needs this. So you have a scheduled dose and then you, on top of that, you have a PRN dose of the bronchodilators. Antibiotics for atypical coverage is ideal. In this case, we're saying um, uh, um, patient doesn't necessarily have a pneumonia. Uh, but if they're in respiratory failure, for example, requiring advanced respiratory support like a BiPAP, increased copious secretions, that would be very, very, in fact, according to gold criteria, it should be the standard. But many people would, you know, by default still add antibiotics because it, it just feels like sometimes if it's early pneumonia, you don't see it on imaging, you might as well start early and help the patient before they get, before things go really, really bad. And more importantly, you don't want to treat and just sit on the patient. You're assessing improvement and overall clinical pictures, picture as things may rapidly change. Because again, respiratory failure can go boom, can go bad in, a, in an instant, and you don't want to be caught, you know, um, uh, uh, unaware. So you want to be clearly assessing if this patient is getting better and knowing what to do if they're not getting better. And obviously next steps, next steps would be all of the other things that you can possibly do to help the patient, whether you're trying to single dose IV magnesium or addressing the rest of failure further if they need other modes of rest of failure. And obviously in this case is the the real eventuality will be if things get bad and they're not getting better on any of the initial respiratory support, you intubate them and put them on mechanical ventilation. Well, so that's it for COPD exacerbation and asthma. Um, I hope you found value in this video. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the comments below. Um, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.